Dr. Sridham? Yes, uh, Dr. Bala. Welcome. Can you hear me? Just yes, I can hear you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For sure. bandwidth purposes, I have right now switched off my video. Sure. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Vaishak, can you hear me? I can hear you, sir, Sri Ram, sir. Okay. I was just wondering if uh, Vaishak would be playing the intro video. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. I can hear you, sir, yeah. Sri Ram. Okay. okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Marishi. tradition of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, One Earth, One Family, is founded upon the inherent oneness of humankind and nature. Yet the unity and balance of the world we live in has diminished due to many complex challenges. Some of the most pressing concerns are the continual rise of carbon emissions resulting in global warming, the rapid growth of the global population, resulting in increased greenhouse gas emissions, unsustainable energy use, 
and deforestation. The acceleration of the climate crisis that is pushing vulnerable and indigenous populations further into the depths of poverty and other economic disparities. Hello? Tackling these climate change impacts calls for serious dialogues and deliberations. To really assess the current state of affairs, gather valuable lessons from the past, and move forward with the right approach. This is more important now than ever, as we are less than a decade away from fulfilling three major initiatives centered towards tackling climate change. The Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals. Shri Mata Amritanandamayi Devi, Chair of the C20, says, There is a rhythm to everything in creation, an undeniable relationship between the entire universe and every living creature within it. The universe is like a vast, interconnected network. Suppose there is a net. If it is shaken in one place, the vibration is felt throughout. Similarly, whether we are aware of it or not, all of our actions reverberate throughout creation. Inspired by this vision, the C20 Working Group on Sustainable and Resilient Communities will showcase the importance of compassionate approaches across key thematic areas such as climate resilience and social justice, environmental sustainability, net zero emission targets, compassion-driven approaches for sustainable and resilient communities. We will work closely with civil society organizations from G20 countries to identify high-impact policy recommendations for implementation. Our working group will engage in dialogues and deliberations to come up with policy recommendations, facilitate events, workshops, and campaigns to showcase efforts by notable international CSOs, collect and review case studies of best practices or udaharans from around the world to raise collective awareness among other activities. We firmly believe that once the decision to help others with compassion is taken, it flows into acts of giving, creating a visual impact of alleviating pain and suffering, thereby creating an atmosphere of unity, harmony and solidarity. We want to create such impactful visuals of compassion so that the circle of giving keeps expanding until no one in the world is left behind. And we realize India's vision for its G20 presidency. Vasudheva Kutumbakam. One Earth, One Family. Good evening, namaste to all, welcome to all to this C20 event. Today we have the theme, Compassion as a Cornerstone for Community and Local Development. This is part of a broader theme of compassion-based approaches for sustainable and resilient communities. I'm pleased to offer my salutations to the chair of C20, Sri Mata Amritananda Mai Devi, to all the distinguished panel members, Brahmakumari Shirikaji. We have Dr. Manisha, who is heading the Sustainable and Resilient Communities Working Group. We have Dr. Bala, who's also going to be part of the panel. Dr. Balakrishnan Shankar is part of this sub-theme of compassion. And he also is the Dean of Engineering at Amrita Vishwavidya Peetam, Amrita Puri Kerala campus. We have several distinguished speakers today. I'm very eagerly looking forward to the presentations. To set the tone, 
I have just a couple of slides that I'd like to use to set the stage in terms of the theme of compassion as a cornerstone for community and local development. And hopefully this setting of the stage will be aligned with the various presentations to follow. And after the presentations, we would have a panel discussion where the panelists would share their thoughts about the presentations and about taking the practical, practicable aspects of the best practices shared by the presenters in their own communities and to know what's worked for them and what recommendations they have for feeding into the policy design and development going forward. And at that time, we would also hopefully have time for some interaction with the participants. So this is the agenda. And I will just take uh, two minutes, two or three minutes to just set the stage. And then I will invite Dr. Balakrishnan Shankar also to share a few thoughts. And then we'll move to the presentations very quickly. I'll first share my screen. So the topic is compassion as a cornerstone for community and local development. When we look at the idea of community development versus local development, we understand that the elements of each of these could be different, but they do get mixed up sometimes. We understand that local development focuses on local living conditions. When it comes to community development, there is perhaps quite a wide variety of definitions of what community development stands for and how inclusive or how exclusive is the definition of community development. Is it possible that by not being inclusive enough that it creates more fragmentation? Is it possible that it perhaps ignores global elements? Is it possible that it perhaps doesn't give adequate importance to the collaborations and cooperations as opposed to competition. So these are thoughts that perhaps we would all have to keep in mind in these discussions and when reading these narratives. But all said and done, there is agreement that when it comes to community development, there are two aspects which are undeniable. One, solidarity, and the other is agency. When we look at this and then look at the connection with the working group, which is sustainable and resilient communities, I think we can make an immediate and direct connection, solidarity and the sustainability, resilience and the agency. So I think that connection is seen quite clearly. Against this background, the question would be, how is it that historically we have seen very clearly that there is an erosion of solidarity, which seems to be such an integral and core aspect of community development? So could it be that it's because of the rise of industrial capitalism? Could it be the nation state social structures? Or again, this is something that happens so often, the head versus the heart kind of debate if you have all head and no heart, and all heart and no head, what happens? So is it possible that we as humanity in our policy design and development seem to give too much emphasis on the instrumental part of the reason and not enough on the value rationality, which I think would be directly connected to compassion. So given this, how is it that the world is now countering or attempting to counter the erosion of solidarity. Certainly there are lots of community development practices and through such discussions as today's, we hope we can get a very good idea of the best practices and take it into our policy design and development. There are lots of public health initiatives, there are microeconomic development initiatives. And of course, what's very important as mentioned before is that all these should be inclusive 
They should have equity and equality as their foundations. And of course, in terms of the empowerment, we need cooperative governance across the globe. And we have seen excellent examples in the aftermath of disasters where civil societies shake hands and do a fantastic job, timely and with great quality, with great commitment, with great engagement in terms of the relief and in terms of development. But could this be the way throughout, not just in the aftermath of disasters? So given this, now the question is, So the question is now, what are these aspects that then can be tied to compassion? And my thought is, my thought is that there are four aspects that perhaps today we will see in the presentations to follow. One, participation. Two, collaboration. Three, capacity building. And four, empowerment. And I'll just take a very, very small but powerful example, which brings in these aspects. There was this a very high impact Bhuj earthquake. The villages of Bhuj in Gujarat, the state of Gujarat in India. And uh, Amma's organization had uh, immediately jumped into action. They went there and they built a lot of houses. They helped immediately in the development. And Later, when there was a tsunami and the ashram itself was affected, the best example of this that there is participation, the collaboration and the capacity building, all those villagers from Bhuj, they came all the way to Kerala, to this island, to Amritapuri. They wanted to help in the relief efforts. So now this is real going around that. They benefited and they immediately swung into action when there was a need. I think this cycle would be a fantastic example of compassion in practice, compassion in action, and it shows how that can really serve as a cornerstone for community and local development. So that's the setting of the stage. And with that, I'm sure that these aspects of participation, collaboration, capacity building, and empowerment are going to be very clearly and directly visible in the presentations to follow. I will request Dr. Bala to give his comments for a couple of minutes, and then we will then move to the introduction of each speaker followed by their presentation. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Bala, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sairam. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. It's really a very important topic that we are discussing today on compassion being a cornerstone in community and local development. You had raised a very important point about community versus local development. Uh, one of Amma's main uh, philosophies that has translated into uh, Amrita University's uh, method of operation is that to think globally, but act locally. So we need to search for cost-effective global solutions, but at the same time, we have to use the solution locally, think globally and act locally. So Amma gives this famous example of uh, those of society. I mean, she compares society to a multi-story building in which there is a, there is a, there's a skyscraper building and the uh, different people are in the different levels of the skyscraper. The poorest are on the ground floor and the slightly better better off is on the first floor and then the second floor. And ultimately, the uh, richest and the wealthiest and the most successful people are on the top floor. So one day the building catches fire on the ground floor and the person from the ground floor runs up to the person on the top floor and says that the building is on fire. And the person on the top floor says, which floor is on fire? And he says, the ground floor is on fire. Then the person on the top floor says, oh, in that case, that's your problem, not mine. I don't have to worry about it. But he doesn't know that the fire will soon catch up to him. Likewise, Amma um, says, this whole world is an interconnected whole. We have to think globally and act locally. And one very important thing is to understand that there is no, there is no such thing as someone else's problems. 
because other person's problems will soon become our problems. And we, when we learn to tackle our problems, we have to think from a global perspective. And that is where the, uh, as you mentioned, the chain of compassion uh, comes in. Uh, when Amma started this uh, women self empowerment, self empowerment movement and helped women start local businesses, what happened was a chain of compassion that started. These women became self-sufficient and they went on to their villages, started businesses, and that helped other families and other women to become self-sufficient and so on and so forth. And then the chain completed in the sense of the very people, the, the, the end of the chain, they, the, the very people whom they helped at one point came forward to help when the uh, original villages were in trouble, etc., etc. So this chain of compassion is very important to start with. I'm very happy that uh, such a, a topic has uh, been chosen for this panel discussion. Uh, I look forward to uh, listening to all the uh, distinguished panelists. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, C20 is discussing compassion so importantly. Uh, I feel that really that is one underlying value uh, that has a potential to change uh, the way the world functions. Uh, thank you, uh, Sayram. Uh, over to you, and uh, let's listen to the panelists. Thank you so much, Dr. Bala, for those comments. Set the tone nicely to transition now. And I would like to introduce first Dr. Uh, so, so I'm sorry. Uh, first, we move to uh, Mrs. Lata Holgare, and I'll just briefly introduce her, and then I'll turn it over to her. So, Ms. Lata Holgare currently serves as secretary of an NGO, Gauri Shankar Bahudeshya Shikshan Sanstha. She resides in Nagpur, Maharashtra, where incidentally we had the C20 inception event. And uh, Ms. Holgare's education is in yogic sciences and she's uh, been from Kalidas University. And she currently, as I mentioned, has her own NGO called Gauri Shankar Bahudeshya Shikshan Sanstha, and she's also a practitioner of medical yoga. So with that very brief introduction, I now turn it over to Ms. Nata Holgari. Nata, ma'am, are you there? Hello. Uh, yeah. This is Shiva. Uh, I'm not able to find Lata Ma'am on the list of speakers. Okay. All right. I will then move to the next person then. So we then uh, move to Dr. Nils Altner. And uh, I'll again start with the bio, a brief intro, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Altner. So Dr. Nils Altner is currently teaching professional self-care as a professor at uh, Alice Salomon University in Berlin. His research focuses on the effects of mindful self-compassion on health, relationships, organizational culture, ecology, and democracy. In, these, in the face of the current global political and ecological challenges, he seeks to contribute to the cultivation of compassion as a cornerstone for community and local development. He develops educational formats that strengthen the university teachers' compassionate relationships first to themselves and then to their colleagues and then to their students and to the shared environment. And he's a graduate of the MBSR professional internship program at the Center for Mindfulness University of Massachusetts. He has intensive experience in Zen and Vipassana meditation, Hatha Yoga, Qigong. He's also a co-author of Incorporating Qigong in Schools in German and author of Mindfulness and Health in German. Dr. Neil Saltner, over to you. Thank you very much, Ian. And, and um, it's a pleasure for, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, there seems to be a little bit of a... Microphone, and then, yeah, now it's better. Okay, so um, I would very much like to 
start with um, a theme that not so much looks into the outside the dimension of communities and how we support each other and find ways of how to live on this planet in a more compassionate and more sustainable way. But I would rather like to start inside and share a few, first of all, images of people looking inside and then also invite you for a little experiment where, if you want, you can join me of looking inside of your own mind and body and then um, experimenting with a way of how to strengthen something that I would like to call self-compassion as maybe a basis of then extending this compassion to others and to the planet as a whole. Just like when Amma said in the introduction that you played in earlier, um, that we're all connected in this web of life, all people, all living beings uh, on this living planet are connected in this web of life. I think that um, each one of us can contribute to this whole web of life by cultivating qualities of self-compassion, compassion and care, first with ourselves and then with the people we work with. And in my case, I'm especially looking at uh, teacher-student relationships in university uh, settings, further education, and also in schools. So um, I will share my slides and simply invite you um, to first look at these people and uh, using your min mirror neuron system in your brain um, to be aware of a resonance inside of you. When you look at these people, their faces, their bodies, the way they sit here. Becoming aware of what qualities you perceive inside of yourself looking at the images of these people. And while doing this, while looking out at these people, these children here, and then also sensing inside, you may notice your attention moving like a pendulum that's moving out, just like the out breath is going out into the world, and then moving back in, just like the in breath is like a pendulum swinging back towards you and inside of you. And the same thing might happen with your attention going out and then swinging back towards and into your own body and your own awareness. All of these people I'm showing you are people who participated in one of our projects with teachers and students in schools, universities, and also hospitals. And in all of these projects, we invite people to cultivate a self-attention that's mindful, that's present, and that is also self-compassionate. And I invite you to do the same while looking at these images, these feet here, for instance, to also be aware of your own sensations in your body, your own feet, your own heart, your own head.
these are students of uh, a teacher training program. And then maybe if you like, take a breath. If you like, close your eyes for a moment, sense your body, allow yourself to inhale and exhale if you like. And when your eyes are closed, it might be easier for your attention to become aware of the resonances inside of yourself that might be felt after looking at all of these pictures. Having listened to the speakers before, to the introduction, and now you're sitting here in this moment, in this virtual group of people gathered around this theme of compassion, resilience, sustainable community development. And I would like you to join me, if you will, uh, in a experiment. Um, and if you don't feel like that, you, of course, don't have to do that. In that case, you can just listen to my voice um, without doing what the voice is suggesting. But if you are interested in experimenting, getting an inside experience, um, I invite you to see if you can remember a maybe recent situation that you found difficult. May it that you interacted with a person who disagreed with you, maybe strongly, or you had an interaction with a person who was demanding something from you that you weren't able or willing to give. See if you come up with something that touched you, maybe not enormously, but in a, in a middle intensity, something that annoyed you without pushing all of your buttons. And then see if you can recall that situation. Maybe when your eyes are closed, you can picture yourself with this person or with these people involved. And remember how your body felt, how your emotions felt. Maybe you can recall what you thought, the words that were spoken. And perhaps also actions that were taken by you and the others. And ideally, you would think of a situation where you didn't act in accordance with your own values. Maybe you were triggered to be mean, sarcastic, ironic, or even hurtful or dismissive. We all have these elements and aspects inside of our personalities, all of these mean and authoritarian and dismissive and hurting aspects are part of each person's personality and especially in situations that are, are very stressful or challenging to us maybe dangerous um, those those aspects will come out and will play out and if you find a situation if you can picture yourself in such a situation i would like you to connect with that inner dialogue right now that is maybe commenting on your memory like if i remember being not fair to my students um i may remember this now and then i may say oh man i i really screwed up there and i didn't live up to my own expectations
If you can, see if you can identify those inner voices that comment on your behavior in that situation. And maybe it's a voice that criticizes what you did, what you felt, what you thought. And see how close you want to get to that inner critical voice. It's not very comfortable to, to notice that and pay attention to that. So I invite you to take good care of yourself and, and go as close to this voice or stay as far away from it as it feels comfortable for you. Find a distance that is comfortable for you. And then listen to this voice from the comfortable distance. Listen to what it has to say. Knowing that you don't have to believe what it says. You don't have to share and agree with what it says, but listen to it. And if you like, and if you feel like it, you can put your hand or maybe even both hands on your chest or somewhere else on your body and feel yourself right now, warm, breathing and alive as a part and a member of this family of all the beings on this planet that are alive right now. And now sensing and feeling this hand on your heart or your body, again, and go in contact with that critical voice inside of you. And if you want to try this little experiment, you can speak to this critical voice, maybe something like, may you be happy. May you feel loved. May you be in peace. Now you turn towards this critical voice inside of you that is criticizing what you did or thought or felt. And you address it. Being connected with your heart and your head. You maybe say, may you be happy critical voice. May you be loved and may you be in peace. And now sensing your breathing body, you may like to bring your attention to the stillness between thoughts. Maybe in the stillness, you can hear other voices besides the loud and critical voice. Maybe there are voices that are more quiet inside of you. And if you like, you can listen to what they have to say. And the loud voices get quiet. And just like in a community or in a democracy, it's important to give attention to the quiet voices. The same may apply to our inner choir of voices. Maybe we can start with the cultivation of a compassionate society by cultivating self-compassion and something like an inner democracy of all the voices, of all the self-aspects that we have inside of ourselves.
giving space and attention to all those different voices and aspects of our personality. So if you have your eyes closed, I invite you to open them. And for this final slide, um, if this quote by Jane Goodall um, is something that um, speaks to you, I invite you to think about what she said once. She said, what you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. In her case, it was uh, discovering that primates, chimpanzees have a emotional and social life, just like we humans do. In other cases, it may be making difference in a teaching and learning environment or in a ecological environment or many other aspects of community life on this planet. And uh, I would like to close with an invitation. Um, if you are interested in uh, cultivating a democratic teaching uh, culture in your teaching contexts, I have a whole uh, list of experiments, practical little experiments that you can try. And um, if you send me an email, you want this is my web, uh, my email address down here. Um, I'd be very happy to share and continue a discussion beyond this meeting today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Niels. We will revert back in the final session with some reflections on your presentation as well. Thank you so much. And now we move on to the next presenter. I'm pleased to introduce to you Mr. Wolimboa Anthony. He's the national coordinator of the Climate Action Network of Uganda. He holds 20 years experience in climate and environment policy work in Uganda. He has worked as a policy analyst and advocate on key policies that include climate change, wetlands management, and peat management. He represents the civil society on National Designated Authority, National Climate Change Advisory Committee, Nationally Determined Contributions Committee, and he's a member of the Technical Steering Committee on Green Growth in Uganda. He has studied environment management and ha has a postgraduate degree in communications and environmental journalism. Over to you, Mr. Anthony. We are really looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Srinam. Yeah, and thanks, uh, my previous uh, speaker, I was uh, really intrigued and um, excited about the presentation. It was really deep. Now I have, uh, I'm going to share a little bit on um, the subject of uh, compassion as a cornerstone to community and local <laughs> government. So, uh, sorry. I'm getting an echo, I don't know. Actually, your video seems a little bit uh, distorted. It's not coming through. Not sure. Oh, is, there there is, is there a light that is kind of uh, behind you or something? I think the background that I chose maybe I need to get started. Okay. okay. Maybe I can go with the video for a while. Okay. Um, okay, so. Yes, just allow me to speak, uh, and also the, the bandwidth here is not as good as your end. So the subject I'm, go I'm going to deal with is uh, on the compassion. Uh, first, I'll, tr I'll try and contextualize uh, in our local context uh, for the case of Uganda. Uh, you're all aware that Uganda is uh, it's a, it's a developing country when uh, post-conflict era having been in war over three decades since the 1970s. We experiencing a lot of um, inequality. Uh, we have a lot of uh, you know, poverty related, uh, poverty and social, and, and social challenges. We are also experiencing a number of uh, climate related 
uh, disasters, uh, that's flooding, that's droughts, that's pests, and many others. And uh, of course, like many global economies were severely hit by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, it really had a big toll on uh, how our communities uh, interact. Actually, it showed the, the nature of how we live. Um, it also looked, I mean, it helped us to understand what compassion means uh, in times of crisis. So we are really, everybody was stuck. But how did we survive? We are surviving because of the compassion with uh, within our groups, within our communities, um, and 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 the number of you know uh, initiatives which came on board, uh, some from government, some from wishers. But above all this, uh, we intend to have more women and youth who are most still affected by uh, COVID nineteen or even when you come to climate change related uh, disasters. So, of course, uh, like uh, uh, Dr. Nils has uh, presented before, compassion is quite uh, a challenging subject to deal with. First of all, it's not very understood. Even when it is practiced, it's not very well understood in uh, both in the policy circles and also in our day-to-day -day living. Uh, we, 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 we tend not to, there's not so much consciousness around it, even when it exists, but it's worse within the policy environment. And yet it's a very, very essential ingredient in building and maintaining uh, healthy, thriving, resilient uh, communities, including institutions. So we need to understand what, what's compassion, how does it relate? to policy, how does it relate to development? And for us, um, a community uh, where compassion thrives uh, has characteristics of it being vibrant, it's resilient, it's able to confront crisis and uh, is able to embrace change or shocks in the economy and in the environment and is able to uh, respond to crisis. Now I'll bring you fast forward to Uganda, maybe to make a better understanding of how um, things work here in terms of compassion. We, we Uganda, as you, hello. Yes, we have uh, we've had challenges in Uganda, uh, particularly uh, the climate-related disasters, and most of them are around landslides in Eastern Uganda and part of Western Uganda. There's flooding in most of the low-lying areas of Uganda. Then we've had the, the, the conflict in Northern Uganda, which took over 20 plus years. You most of you are aware of the, uh, the war uh, by the LRA, the Lord Resistance Army which claimed a lot of lives and destroyed uh, entire communities, the whole of uh, Northern Uganda. So how did uh, we respond as a country? First of all, the, the, the government, I must commend, they did uh, quite, uh, they put a lot of effort, but also at the community level, in that region, there is something called the Matopot. It's built around, it's, a, it's kind of like, a, 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 it's a local justice system, for example, which looks at, yes, there's a lot of adversity, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, people have uh, maybe um, done crimes. So how do you move forward? So through that kind of system, they recognize the challenges, and people, once they co confess and they show sympathy, they show, uh, you know, uh, care and, 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 the, and love, and they're able to apologize, then they're able to move on. And, and for us, at, at that community level, there's a deep sense of compassion within, you know, like our cultural systems. 
So people are able to move on despite the fact that the war was extremely, extremely bad and caused a lot of damage. Then um, I'll give you another example. In the central region uh, where we are operating now, there's what we call the community-driven cleaning exercise. You know, uh, in most of the developing urban cities, we have a big, big challenge of uh, waste management. And the city authorities or urban authorities do not have sufficient funds. So what the community does, especially in the central region here through the kingdom, they do what they call Burundi 1C. It's a community-driven cleaning exercise. But, and, and, and that helps now to build that sense of belonging, that sense of community, a sense of responsibility. Because once you do that, then you solve a lot of problems. You, you're able to save on uh, a lot of money. Then the other uh, issue is on uh, Uganda's policy within, uh, I mean, the refugee hosting uh, policy in Uganda. It's where you'll find a lot of practice of how compassion works. I you know it's not mentioned there, uh, per se, but you will see that the way it, it operates, it's, it's, it's grounded around compassion. For example, refugees are allowed to interact here with the local communities. They can be hosted for communities which have um, space, or they can, whenever you have disasters in the Eastern part of Uganda, the government has uh, asked communities to uh, help people who are in need to be hosted for the period that maybe that disaster is happening until the government provides support. Yeah, so maybe I'll just touch on one or two things on uh, raising awareness on the need uh, and the importance of compassion in policy design. Of course, how do we do that? How can we raise awareness? Uh, like I noted earlier, most of our policies, for example, don't have this written out. They don't have, um, it's not direct. So what do we do? How can we raise awareness in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, ensuring that we have compassion in building in our policy processes? So we need to uh, highlight examples of compassionate policies. We need to engage policymakers. Uh, we need to use social media these days because it's generating a lot of debate and encouraging people to think more deeply about the impact of policies. Then we also need to uh, work very closely with the uh, advocacy groups, but more importantly, educating the public, having a mindset change like our, uh, for example, the National Development Plan for the current one, the, the third development plan, has a whole chapter on uh, mindset. And I, I believe this is built around how do we change people's minds, behavior, people to be compassionate. Because even if you bring in a very good uh, program of development, once people don't have the education, they're not compassionate, then you'll be wasting a lot of effort. So, and uh, the last part is on uh, best practices. We need to focus on uh, empathy and understanding. Uh, we need to foster a sense of community, like I've talked before on uh, this community cleaning exercises. We need to look at empowering individuals. Yeah, once you empower individuals, they're able to take up ownership of their own lives and positive uh, changes. Like now in the refugee setup, the policy here in Uganda is uh, that we need to have households and individuals empowered because as you know, most of the refugees here are staying longer. So it's, it's an example of how you can empower individuals to take ownership of their life and make positive changes. And indeed there's a lot happening, a lot of positive you know, outcomes uh, via that policy. That's one of the best practices. Then uh, we need to collaborate with community organizations um, as a best practice. Uh, this is done to ensure that uh, the interventions respond to uh, local community needs. Because most of the program designs that we have, especially in the, in the donor aided development, 
it lacks this element of uh, responsiveness to community needs. Uh, then we also need to evaluate and adapt because all the time we're in a changing world, things are so dynamic. So, but unfortunately, this doesn't seem to happen all, uh, in most cases. But as a good practice, we need to evaluate and adapt uh, effectively. Then lastly, we need to practice self-care. You know, this work of compassion, if you worked in an environment, a hospital environment or in a refugee setup, you, if you are not careful, you end up uh, suffering burnout. So as practitioners, as individuals who are involved in this uh, kind of work, we need to really pay attention to ourselves. Uh, like somebody said that he, you are uh, like your body is more like you know it's, it's like a, a, a factor or something like that which you need to take care of if you don't it will collapse so I, i'd like to beg to stop here and thank you so much for listening to me i know it's not a very common subject uh, to discuss um, and also relate uh, to the kind of work that we do because uh, for us we do a lot of work on climate change uh, we deal with the disasters, and I can assure you, uh, this subject, if we had known earlier, I think we would have solved most of our challenges in the communities. So allow me to stop here for the while. Thank you, Mr. Antri. You covered several points relating to raising of awareness on empathy, on uh, co compassion and practice, on uh, awareness on best practices and, and uh, raising the awareness amongst the policymakers, amongst educationists, amongst the public and households and individuals. I think a lot of these, definitely we need to make them actionable. And I think uh, perhaps there'll be an opportunity to get the thoughts of our panel members as well on these aspects a little down the road today. So thank you once again. And uh, just to keep up with the time, I'll now move on to the next presenter. So I will introduce Dr. Tom Voitis. And uh, after that, I will request him to also introduce a couple of uh, his colleagues, uh, if you will, and uh, because I think he's been working with them very closely. He knows them well. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be a privilege listening to them uh, uh, with the deep impact that they've had in their communities. Uh, and this is really service in action, I think, that we are going to listen to now. So first, uh, just a very quick introduction. Uh, so Dr. Tom Poitis is a chiropractic physician who's been in practice for 41 years. And for over 30 years, he's been studying with anthropologists, shamans, and Native American elders, as well as 35 years of training in Qigong. His approach to healing is comprehensive combining knowledge of biomechanics, as well as what is learned about life through relationships with indigenous cultures. And this is what led to Pine Ridge Reservation about 17 years ago when he was introduced to a Lakota elder. And that's essentially what gave birth to Lakota Circle, which I think we are going to hear about. And he's eternally grateful for that friendship. And while that dear brother has passed on, the wisdom, humility, humility, generosity, and kindness that he shared has helped share our values and commitment to serving the Lakota people through our Lakota circle. So I, I, now I hand it over to Dr. Tom, and then he can perhaps introduce at the right time, uh, Ms. Leslie Mestet and Ms. Rose Fraser. So over to you, Dr. Tom. Uh, I believe you've muted. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank yes. you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Spriam, for this opportunity. Um, I, I first do want to thank Ama for her tireless uh, guidance and love and compassion and taking on this leadership role in the C20 G20 Summit. There's actually a connection um, between Ama, uh, myself, and the Lakota people. Um, I had been receiving darshan from Ama for over 30 years. And 10 years ago, they opened an ashram here uh, in the Chicago area. 
And uh, it was a large center, about a hundred some acres of land. And they wanted a Native American blessing when Ama came in for the program. And someone knew me, said, this guy, Tom, knows Native people. Can you bring Natives here to bless the land? So I, we were able to bring, about, I think, about 11 powwow singers and drummers to dedicate the land when Ama came in. And that actually developed a much deeper relationship with the ashram and also one of the Swami in residence. We actually traveled with me and some other people six years ago. Well, we put together a contingent of people meeting elders and activists in the community of what they need. And it was kind of interesting because um, there's a long history of misguided management, um, native people in the US government, and have been a lot of repression of culture and language. And so when there was an, an elder I had not met before, and when we started the, the, the discussion, he asked why we were here. And he said, we don't need saviors. And there was a collective silence in the room. And, and I hadn't, I'll back up a little bit. I hadn't been coming there for 10 years prior to that. And if I didn't gain the wisdom I did from being there 10 years, and I'll, I'll get more into that later, I wouldn't have been able to handle that situation, I think with maturity and some wisdom on my own part. And we had a wonderful conversation. And it, it, it turned out the bottom line was the dialogue that we didn't really want anything from you. Um, the whites historically have been known um, as washisha, those that take the best parts and leave the rest behind. And, and I know in my heart and soul, that's not who I was. Um, I may have been part of that <laughs> prior to coming up there, um, but I learned a lot. So backing up, um, I first went to Pine Ridge 17 years ago. I went through a friend who was working with youth at risk and, and bringing people up um, uh, with this elder uh, for ceremonies. They call hambletcha. It's where you fast and pray for days in the hills by yourself. So when I met this elder, he suggested and encouraged me to come up and do the same. So for seven years, I went up and prayed in the hills and fasted. And that's what formed me as a person, a man, as a human being. I didn't go up there to start a charity. I came to find out who I am. And I think just kind of backtracking on the compassion, you know, I think there's so much self-centeredness in the world that this is different. It's becoming centered in yourself. And the Lakota people, as a lot of indigenous, are very nature-based, elemental. And you find that out when you, when you sit in 117 degree weather or 30 degree weather, no tent, no food, no water for days you begin to understand who you are. So I have a great respect for their ways. And so it was through that that I, I was introduced to actually um, Rose. Um, and we just kind of got together as an informal group helping they needed food, clothing, you know, toys. And it was mostly around holidays. And then it became clear as our relationship developed and I saw that particular what Rose was doing, a remarkable woman. I can't wait for you to hear her story. Um, that it became clear that a lot of the giving came around holidays when our generosity peaks, but then they're left there um, to deal with the situations. And I did send um, a, a, a list or a demographics of some things in the Lakota culture that not a lot of people are aware of. Life expectancy for men is 48 years old for, uh, and, and 52 for women. And, and, and this isn't meant to paint a negative picture, it's just a the situation they deal with on a daily basis, which honestly makes the story that Leslie and Rose share much more remarkable. Um, so, it, you know, the bottom line is um, I've learned a lot and actually I've unlearned a lot <laughs> from being up there. And again, I, I really respect the wisdom and the humanitarian nature of the Lakota people. All of their spiritual qualities are humanistic. Are you respectful? Do you have gratitude, humility, perseverance, generosity, courage? all of those, and they want, if you're that, then you're a good human being, and then the doors open, and a lot more of the sharing can happen in building community, which is what the, what the Lakota culture is based on. Um, so basically, that's about all I wanted to say, because the time really belongs to these remarkable women. So I wanted to introduce uh, Leslie Mestis, and uh, who I've honestly just met recently. Uh, we do attend ceremonies with her brother, and it's through those ceremonies that I was able to meet uh leslie and so uh leslie it's your 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 forum now thank you tom i want to first begin by acknowledging the ama 
lady, saint, <laughs> and okay. saying prayers for you and your family. And I also um, want to just mention in our language, Lakota language, the word for compassion is unshila. And it's a it's the foundation of everything that that we we are and we do. Um, I work. My name is Leslie Mastip Clifford. I'm Oglala Lakota here on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. We at First Peoples Fund look to. They do a lot of work with indigenous people across the United States and Alaska and Hawaii to save the cultural knowledge and traditional teachings of indigenous people. And it's really important that we save these things for future generations, these teachings. The, um, the slide, I don't know if I can share it, but I'll just start going off of my presentation. Building the capacity of intergenerational native artists on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Founded in 1995 and based in Rapid City, our mission is to honor and support the collective spirit of First Peoples artists and culture bearers. Collective spirit is that which manifests self-awareness and a sense of responsibility to maintain the cultural fabric of one's community. Since 1999, we have supported a total of 4,038 Native artists to support their development as entrepreneurs and cultural leaders. We have our core programs of fellowship programs, organizational grants, programs, professional development workshops taught by certified and business coaches, the Dances with Words program and the Rolling Res Art. We have three core foundations where we talk about how we lead with our head, our culture and our heart and how all of these things, three things are tied together so that we remain strong in the work that we do. Our principles, values, and strategies include knowing, the wisdom and humility, honoring, respect, and integrity, sharing with generosity, strength, and fortitude, culture bearers and artists, self-determined, knowledgeable leaders, indigenous communities, sustainable, reciprocal relationships, indigenous arts ecology, a holistic collective system. And at the base of all of this is compassion, compassion for each other as artists, as leaders, and as communities and indigenous people of the land. In 2013, the, we did a market study and it was called Establishing a Creative Economy, Art as an Economic Engine in Native Communities. This survey examined household economic economics, infrastructure needs, and social networks of Native artists to help define the role of the Native artists within reservation economies, evaluate the effectiveness of support programs currently available, and identify challenges faced by Native artists and opportunities to better support them. This included 102 Pine Ridge-based artists and culture bears who did the survey. The survey found that 30% of tribal members on the Pine Ridge Reserv Reservation identify as artists. 40% of native households on the Pine Ridge rely some, on some form of traditional arts for cash income. And 50% of artists report space is important to create or sell work. And nearly 100% of emerging artists do not have access to equipment, supplies, and materials to create their art. So with the study, we found that six resources um, Native artists need to be successful entrepreneurs and community and cultural leaders include markets, supplies,
then it brings us to the Oglala Lakota Art Space, which is located in Kyle, South Dakota. Miss Leslie, I think you've been muted now. If you could please unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. It's a partnership with ArtSpace, the Lakota Fund, and First Peoples Fund. There was an early pilot phase in 2020. 16, where we created a rolling res art bus that goes out to each community. There are nine districts on the reservation, and the reservation is the size of Connecticut with an 80% unemployment rate. Um, we did groundbreaking in 2018. Construction was completed in 2020, and we moved in in 2021. As of today, the, the grand we're preparing for a grand opening in May on May 20th of this year. We had a late start due to COVID. Um, we got a grant through our ANA project called the Building the Capacity of Intergenerational Native Artists on the Reservation. And it's directly related to achieving the long-term community goal of Pine Ridge to continue the healing and strengthening of our people by bolstering identity and opportunity through the unique and beautiful perspective of Lakota knowledge, culture, and language to create meaningful economic and job opportunities that reignite cultural identity. Oglala Lakota Art Space hosted, we just started, so we've hosted 47 sessions of beading, sewing, traditional foods, traditional dance regalia workshops, reaching 160 individuals on the reservation and bringing back that knowledge of community, compassion and generosity to our community. We work with several artists. One of them I featured in my presentation is Keith Braveheart. He's an enrolled citizen of the tribe. He's a great visual artist and arts educator, currently holding the position of art instructor at Oglala Lakota College. He received his education from the Institute of American Indian Arts, and he's been involved with Native arts education for 15 years through the Oscar Howe Summer Institute. I also have Helene Gaddy, who I featured. Um, she resides on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and her passion is sewing and making Lakota dance regalia. As many He is no stranger to the art scene, rodeo arena. You might even catch him on a movie set or a commercial during the Super Bowl. And a few of his talents include acting and songwriting. His songs are in movies and be, can be downloaded on Spotify. And I just also have a picture of the art space and the different features that we have there. And then my contact information on the last slide. I'm not sure if you guys can see it. I did send it in, so you may share, be able to share it. That is my presentation. And thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I really appreciate it and wish you a blessed day. Thank you so much, you. Ms. Leslie. Uh, before we proceed, I just uh, saw the note in the chat window our uh, panel member, Pramukumari uh, Shivika Ji, I think she has to leave. Shivika Ji, if you're still there, would you like to just share your thoughts briefly before you leave? I guess not. Okay. All right. Over to you, Tom. Okay. okay. Um, so, so now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Rose Frazier. Um, I don't think she's slept maybe in the past 10 years. 
she's she's a remarkable um, uh, woman. And again, I, I first met her probably ten years ago, and we were just helping out, you know, delivering food, driving trucks out with food, clothing, and toys during Christmas, and. And, uh, you know, and then just watching what she was accomplishing there 365 days a year, feeding hundreds of people, the outreach, and then the dreams and vision she had were remarkable working out of a, a basically, um, it just seemed like a few hundred square foot, uh, building. And then her dream of a community center, gardens, uh, greenhouses, walking paths. I mean, is this, this woman is, is, is <laughs> again, just remarkable. And uh, uh, with great respect, uh, Rose, uh, please share who you are. <laughs> uh, hello, thank you. First of all, thank you for allowing me to speak on this. I did not realize how big and huge, I mean, this is like international, so I really do appreciate Tom. Um, he views me as a humanitarian for all things and all reasons, but um, I just like doing my daily job. So thank you for allowing me to speak here. Uh, my name is Rose Frazier. I am an Oglala Lakota. I have lived here my entire life on a Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. I'm from a small community called Kyle, and I operate a program called Oya to Touch a Project. Oya to Touch a Project means Young People's Project, and we've been in business since 1993. Um, the program I'm going to talk about right now is our Medicine Root Gardening Project. It's a passion of mine. Um, we grow food and we educate um, people our families on growing their own food. It's a nine month gardening curriculum and we had we start in February and we go through October. So we teach everything. We do a 16 indoor classes for gardening and that includes everything from seedling, um, from garden preparation, garden planning, um, seedling, production, uh, when to plant, um, irrigation, fertilization, um, harvesting, preservation. So it's a nine month program that we have. And I didn't get to throw or send in my slide or anything because like Tom said, we are very, very busy right now. We just opened up our doors to a new 21,000 square foot building. And so it's been quite, I've been quite busy trying to get this one off of the ground. We opened our doors in January, but our program has started. Uh, we continue to do it even through COVID and stuff. And so it's a nine month gardening gardening mm -hmm. class and we started out in 2016 with eight students um, and then 2017 with 12 students and these are just local area for our community which is Kyle and I think our demographics here is somewhere around 4,200 people I'm not sure about that number but it's a small community and then in 2019 when we opened it up to the reservation wide to online districts we got an overwhelming amount of 68 people that attended our class and like tom mentioned we had a really small building and that's a, that's a like a 6200 square foot building and we crammed 68 people in it that first day of introductions and stuff and it was just overwhelming it was it was really good to see the response that people showed on they wanted to um, they were interested in growing their own food. So that was a really good and surprising number to see in our building and stuff. And then from there, we just kept it up and we had it um, opened reservation wide. So we continue to grow. And then during a pandemic um, in March of 2020, we had 68 students involved in our gardening program. And then when the pandemic hit, we got an overwhelming response of people wanting to grow their own food. You know, everybody had shortages of food, toilet paper, all of these things that was going on during the pandemic. And so we started, a, um, even though our program was two months into it, we did a, a Zoom class on basic gardening and we had a hundred, an additional 114 people that participated in that. So our 2020 year was 179 families that we actually worked with. <laughs> And the really good thing about our program is we have this program that goes with it and it's called Tools for Success. So every portion that you complete with our gardening program, we give you a gardening manual to start out. We help you with the calendar of when to start your planting. Um, we teach you about your frost dates. Um, and we also teach you when to plant your, your soil, your I mean, do your soil temperature and everything like that. We teach you, we have you do a layout of your land mm. from above if you're looking over your, your your house, so we teach you how to um, get the most light. So all of these things that were, um, there was a lot of programs way back then and being part of one of them myself, I didn't know anything about gardening. And then, so I think that educating our people on, on 
just basic techniques on when to water and how to harvest these things is really important. And I believe that other people really learned a lot. We had people in our gardening program who were gardeners for 20 plus years and still learned something from our program. You know, crop rotation, succession planting, there's different things that people have learned even though they've been gardening their entire lives. So that was really a stepping stone for me to hear our, our elders talked to me about, you know, you really taught us something. We didn't realize that this is what we needed for our soil. They didn't know anything about fertilizers and our, and our fertilizers that we use, we use all natural fertilizers. So it was really an honor to have all of the uh, people come to our, our programs and stuff and see what we've done. We do different methods of gardening right now. We teach what worked for us in our program. Uh, we do square foot gardening, hay bale gardening, a mid lighter gardening. Um, container gardening, a no-till gardening, and high tunnel and um, hoop house growing. Um, that's like a extended growing of your, your, we only have like a hundred and, I wanna say 118 or 143 growing days in our season. So having a high tunnel or, or a grow house has really helped us extend our growing season. The first year that we got it, we got one from Tom in Lakota Circle. They purchased our high tunnel for us. We didn't know anything about it. We didn't know what to do with it. And it sat there for a year. <laughs> until we actually, I took a gardening class and I was really impressed and I was I was really excited to see what, what can happen in here. And so we had the very first, our very first tomatoes for our growing area normally and typically is in July. We can have our tomatoes um, fresh and ready for us on July, on June 1st, um, if we put our tomatoes in the ground in April in that high tunnel. And then we can extend our growing season all the way up until November. The first week of November, basically the first really severe snowstorm. Um, our latest was November 14th. So using a high tunnel is really beneficial for us. Um, we talk about soil blocks versus the plastic containers and watering, you know, drip irrigation. A lot of people in our area don't know about drip irrigation. And then using drip irrigation versus the sprinkler system has really been, is really, um, it benefits your plants more because the water is going directly to the roots and not on top of it where, where the leaves are. And some plants don't like the leaves. Um, I mean, don't like the water under leaves. Uh, we do garden planning, spacing and scheduling when to start your plants and when to um, fertilize them. We talk about in insect control, um, beneficial bugs and beneficial plants, um, the vertical growing, this is an advanced class, uh, our vertical growing and extending your season. So you have to take a beginner class and a, and a um, intermediate and then an advanced class. And, and so our program, typically you should be in it about three years before you can actually be, be really successful at it. So when you, when you take our 16 weeks and it becomes May, like right now we're talking about um, our new students, our new students, every new student receives um, gardening tools they receive fencing and irrigation, and then we, we, we go out and we till their gardens for them so that they'll be able to, you know, everything that they've learned through these months from January till May, they, they can implement whether they want to do the, the no-till gardening, um, the square foot gardening, um, hay bale gardening, whatever choice they chose to do, they, we are able to, we want to help them with that. And so, so far with all of our programs, since we actually started, since we had funding to actually do our program, we've helped over 555 families. And so our program has gained a lot of success. We do have it being implemented in Wombly right now through another pro nonprofit organization over there. We had it implemented in the um, correction facilities in Pine Ridge. And we also have a farmer's market. We collaborate with a, uh, another partner over in Red Cloud that has a farmer's market on that side of the, the reservation. We also have a food, um, a mobile market. One of the things that I really wanted was um, to take our produce out to the districts because you can't really get fresh local produce around here. And even if you do, the 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 small grocery stores, we, don't, we have one small grocery store around here and the rest of them are we call convenience stores and they don't have healthy options, you know? So it's really something for me. I really believe that if we, and I'm, we're not trying to make a really big book or anything. I just want them to have access to it. So we accept EBT SNAP benefits for our produce and stuff. And the reason why we don't just give it away is because I want people to know that they too can make a seasonal income off of the produce that they like in, um, um, 
if they have an abundance of it, if they have more than they can have, you know, handle at their home, then they can participate in our farmer's market and earn some type of income for themselves. We had a couple of really success stories on our, on our entrepreneurs. We had a lady that made over $8,000 in a season and she was able to buy herself a high tunnel. We had another um, business that was able to buy, or a, a gardener that was able to buy himself a tiller, another one that was able to buy himself a, a little trailer. So there is money to be made in a seasonal gardening, um, a seasonal, um, doing seasonal income and stuff. So the other part of it that we have is our preservation. So whenever you go through it and then you're going through um, May, June, this is your time to select your garden and stuff and then participate in a farmer's market. We also come back and we help you do preservation, food preservation for your harvest and stuff. And so we teach you your basic water bath canning. We do um, dehydration, we do freeze drying. Um, and then we also teach you traditional methods. So we, we go back to our own culture and stuff and, and share how our ancestors and our and our people used to dehydrate it and pre, um, preserve food and stuff. So we include, include a lot of the Lakota culture into our food um, preservation and stuff. And then so for the for our most successful year, we have grown over 50,000 tons of produce or 25 tons mm -hmm. of produce, 50,000 pounds of produce. That was our most successful year. And then we go up and down because of the snowstorms. We got held out and we when we try to encourage people to continue to grow their produce and stuff, there are going to be times when Mother Nature just doesn't want us to have a successful garden. And so during those times we plan for contingency and we overgrow, we overplant and stuff. And then if there's things that we don't need in our garden, we gave away our seedlings. Well, this year is going to be different because we have a nursery. We have a first, one of the first nurseries on a Pine Ridge Indian reservation. We don't know if it's going to be up and running this year, but we're planning and planting for that nursery. So we're planting additional seedlings that we would be able to sell to our community members here on a Pine Ridge reservation. We also have our mobile market that's going to be up and running this year. Last year was our pilot project and we took it out to Pine Ridge um, to Bowie's uh, grocery store and we sold out there. That was during the Oglala Nation powwow. And then we also took it to um, Porcupine, um, not Porcupine, but Sharps Corner. And then we have, um, we collaborate with Singing Horse Tra Trading Post and she has a little cooler over there where she, she's in Manderson. And then so she gets produce from gardeners in that area that participated in our program and she buys produce and she sells it from her store. We also have our new beautiful building here where we're gonna be able to sell our produce. Um, we're, we're doing, um, the, the market is going to be out and about, but we're also going to have a daily market here. So when we're not out and about, we'll still be able to have produce available for people that want to come and buy it locally here. So we have the farmer's market bus. And then now we have this really big, beautiful building and stuff. And this was the main reason why I was really seeking a commercial kitchen was because of all these families that are growing the produce. And we didn't have no commercial kitchen at the time when we were trying to get all of our our produce um, harvested and produce um, preserved. There was no commercial kitchen here and there were so many rules and regulations on the South, South Dakota um, side of it. You have to have a commercial kitchen in order to sell your produce at a farmer's market. And so we actually got two of our recipes published in um, South Dakota's a USDA program so that Marlene would be able to sell her beets. And then we also did the traditional choke cherry jams and jellies, those, those wild berries that we get. And so those ones are our recipes that we were able to sell. But now South Dakota changed their, their farmer's market laws where we're able to do home canning. But because of all of that, I wanted a commercial kitchen. So we have a commercial kitchen right now. So our families are gonna be able to use a bigger uh, freeze dryer, a bigger uh, pressure canner, and then we have dehydrating dehydrators here. So people will be able to, the ones that are in our gardening program will be able to utilize our kitchen for free. And then to, to finish that one off, we also have a cafe here. And so like right now we're trying to test the waters on what sells and what doesn't sell. It was really hard and it still is really hard for me to try to get lettuce and spinach and kale and the fresh greens into our district and into everybody's diets. Um, one of the things that was always, when we were out to the farmer's market and we had lettuce and we had uh, kohlrabi, we had leeks and Swiss chard, people didn't know how to prepare that food. So that was another reason why we wanted a teaching kitchen. 
So in our new building, we have a home economics kitchen so that when our produce starts coming in, then we can start sharing recipes on how to prepare the vegetables that we grow. So it's a whole cycle. It, it just kind of grew and it kind of blew up. And so not, like right now, we have four high tunnels. We have a greenhouse that got extended to double in size. So it's now 24 by 16. We're going to have a 30 by a 72 nursery first on the Pine Ridge Reservation. We have our mobile market. And then we're going to have, we have a commercial kitchen. We have our cafe. And then in my, my 2025 goal is to return, um, change our little old center into our, the first whole foods market on the Pine Ridge Reservation. We, the other thing that we did too with, um, we partner with uh, another nonprofit organization who wants to buy our produce and incorporate some of our fresh produce into their food boxes. So we're, they're gonna bring the um, canned goods and stuff like that. And then we're gonna supplement, um, put some of our fresh vegetables in them. And then that's gonna be a community food box distribution. So that is us in a nutshell. We do a lot more other things here, but I think my topic is on gardening. Um, you can look us up at oyatotechaproject.org. That's our face. And, and on Facebook, it's Oyatotecha Project. Our Medicine Root Garden, or our Medicine Root Farmer's Market is our other Facebook page. Um, we're still trying to get on Instagram. I'm still growing my staff. So all of these things that we've done in the past, I did with four staff members and a lot of volunteers. All of, the, all of the volunteers is basically my family. I had to have them come in and, you know, say, hey, I need your help. Can you come over and help us? And then we also collaborate with organizations such as Tom's. We brought in church groups, um, different organizations that wanted to come do community service. We also built some pavilions at the post office to start our farmer's market area right there. So there's a lot of things happening with our gardening program. So I'm really proud of it. It's a, it's a really big passion of mine. And I'm proud of the success that it's, it, it's gotten. And we just want to continue to grow and make sure that everybody has a garden at their homes and they're feeding themselves. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on this wide. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> totally blown away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rose. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. So Sriram. I actually, I need to uh, get to my patients. So sure. I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, sign off. But again, thank you so much for this opportunity. Greatly appreciate it. And there's dozens more like her that, that would be well worth hearing what they're doing, again, in very, very difficult conditions. So many blessings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Tom. Okay. So okay. this actually, I have to thank you, uh, especially for introducing uh, Ms. Leslie and Ms. Rose. You know, uh, just listening to these lovely ladies today, uh, we have this term, udaharans, which means examples of best practices. And uh, we are in the process of collecting it for the C20 Secretariat. And it seems to me, if I just uh, focus on Ms. Rose, I can write a whole book with just the stuff that she's done. <laughs> so we'll definitely bother you, if you don't mind, to collect uh, so more mind. information from you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much. I need to get, I need to, get to work. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> so moving on. I have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Sunil Silva, who is a senior consultant, National Cooperative Council of Sri, La Sri Lanka. I, I, and, I've just been on for over an hour and a half. With, well, let me get this and this. Okay. Sure. Um, so we have Dr. Sunil Silva. He comes with a rich background in economic statistics. Uh, governance and cooperative development, women's studies, and more. And he's had several positions as a senior consultant, director, and uh, manpower consultant, training coordinator, and so on. He's also been with World Bank and World Sri Lankan Mission. So with that said, uh, I want to listen to you, Dr. Sunil, so I'm keeping the introduction very brief, and now it's over to you. Dr. Sunil, are you there? Uh, sure, sir. Uh, actually, he's not here. In this. Oh, he's not there? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. If that's the case, then we've come to the last of the presenters. Uh, we've had a delightful evening, very informative. Uh, by the way, there was a message on the chat window that somebody wasn't able to hear the posts. Am I audible or has there been a problem all along?
Shivan or anyone? You are audible, uh, sir. Uh, all yes, right. sir. You are audible, sir. All right. Okay, uh, Dr. Bala, if you wouldn't mind coming on video for a few minutes, perhaps we can uh, take some questions and, and have some interaction with the audience if they have any comments and questions. And I request the panel members also, whoever is available, to, sure. to uh, be on video so that we can just uh, have some Q&A. Okay, uh, so let me just open the floor to any questions and comments now. If not, I have a couple of things that I'd like to take up. Okay, so first thing, if I may just make a tie between uh, the narratives from Dr. Niels and, uh, and uh, request Dr. Bala to share some comments. Here's what I was uh, thinking. Dr. Neil spoke about the inner dimensions and about awareness and about the resonance. And uh, self, going from self-compassion to compassion for others. But the one that really struck me and especially the hands-on kind of uh, session that he had, the reflection and the self-reflection, it seems like these could be very important uh, foundations and uh, if he's been able to do that uh, with the school level, college level uh, settings, uh, that shows a lot of promise. And it also perhaps shows scalability. So I thought, uh, Dr. Bala, you have experience as an academician as well. And perhaps you could reflect on this and uh, share some comments about this, whether this, how this could be practically implemented in uh, achieving that inner democracy that he spoke about. Um, absolutely. Uh, the can you hear me? Yes. There is some feedback here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the importance of uh, from what Dr. Niels was talking about is to look at your inner voice and keep yourself distance and look at yourself with a kind of a detachment. And then you learn to be compassionate to yourself. And then from there, you learn to be compassionate with others. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, works both ways. I mean, in terms of uh, teaching and the teacher-student relationship. Um, and uh, a, 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 an attitude of compassion towards oneself and the others will greatly help. The, you're talking about in the educational setting. The teacher-student relationship will help in the teacher actually encouraging the students to work on their difficulties, uh, etc. Here at Amrita, I've had examples of students with a deep, you know, in the Indian context, we still have a, a more intimate teacher-student relationship. We are not just a role number. And so the I've had examples of, you know, teachers being compassionate to students and making a breakthrough uh, with students who had very uh, deep personal trauma and were unable to, uh, you know, perform well in their education because of the personal trauma that they had. And there are several examples where compassion has helped um, to reach out to such people in a very personal uh, way without any expectation. Uh, but it just helps them to um, accept the, 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 you know, the negativity in their life and go on. So one point that you had mentioned about the distance uh, to keep yourself at a comfortable distance from the and, and look at the inner uh, processes that go on that the distance is uh, an impersonal distance is quite it's very uh, it's counterintuitive you're compassionate with yourself and others but at the same time uh, it helps uh, it, it's not it's not like a personal relationship that you get into compassion can be very very strong and very impersonal at the same time so then that doesn't threaten the student who's receiving it he doesn't feel it as an intrusion of his privacy that's what i'm trying to say so you can be very compassionate to a student at the same time help the student be very independent and uh, feel quite uh, self-reliant so uh, this is again this is this is slightly different from the traditional way of, I mean, what people can think is that um, when you show compassion to somebody else, you're kind of making that person dependent on you. That's not what it is. 
So when you show compassion to somebody else, if it's true compassion, you're freeing that person, enabling that person to be independent and solve his own or her own problems. That is one thing that I had to say. Uh, and from the Indian philosophical context, um, you talk about the mirror neurons. You had talked about mirror neurons and people mirroring each other's uh, mental processes. You know, Amma says it's like, you know, one sun reflected in 10 pots. Uh, we see 10 pots of water and the sun and reflected in 10 pots. It's not like there are 10 suns, but the same sun that's reflected in all these pots. So in the Indian philosophical context, they say it's the same consciousness in all beings. And basically it's the oneness of life that, you know, Amma is talking about and the saint and the Indian philosophical tradition talks about. And eventually, ultimately, that's where compassion uh, uh, leads us to, to understand the oneness of life, the interconnectedness of life. And, uh, and compassion being a very powerful tool, which is both an expression of that oneness and also an, uh, a method to reach that oneness. Uh, that's all I have to say at that point right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Bala. And uh, Dr. Niels, do you have any uh, follow-up on that? Yeah, I have a very strong resonance to what you're saying, Dr. Bala. The, to me, it's, it sounds like if, if this interconnectedness of all sentient beings, and maybe we can include the plants and the living planet as a whole, if that is the, the nature of being alive, then it's no effort in a sense of that we have to learn something new it's rather a returning to the natural state of being alive and being sentient on this planet. So, um, and what you said about impersonal and, and dependence, I like to think about um, the cultivation of, an, of, a, of a lesser ego. So the ego seems to be getting in the way between me and this being aware of being connected, being actually one with everything that's alive. So if I, if I find ways, and as you said, compassion and self-compassion can be methods. And, and uh, uh, Sridham, as you said, they are scalable, they are teachable, and we can teach people to teach them and can teach people to create classrooms that are trauma sensitive and maybe even healing to a certain degree. And um, and I think this this uh, summit today, this this um, meeting here with all of us from Pine Ridge, uh, India, Germany, Uganda, um, is an expression of that being one and creating this web of life, strengthening this web of life in our minds. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, there is a there is an oft uh, repeated saying when we move from I to we, we move from illness to wellness. And uh, this, I think, is being reflected in all the practices that we have heard today. Uh, so I have a, a question for Miss Rose, if you're there. Yeah. So, you know, we've been speaking uh, along sort of two uh, approaches. One is raising the awareness. And there, there is perhaps an overt and an explicit attempt to speak about compassion and to, to reflect on what it means and what it means as a value, what it means in practice and so on. But then what I get a flavor of when I listen to you, uh, Ms. Rose, is it's not just, it's not so much of uh, speaking about compassion, but just compassion in action. And so uh, I just wanted to see if there was any conscious design about uh, incorporating compassion or it just is the way in Pine Ridge uh, and in Lakota community. And it just so happened that uh, with, the, with that elemental uh, approach that it just happened. Um, well, I think that I, I really like what you guys have at the front of your thing, the participation, collaboration, capacity building and empowerment. I really believe that. And um, we have a center here. It's a youth center. It's also a community center and stuff. And so 
I think bringing all of those aspects to our community and stuff and letting people, I just feel really compassion to everybody. I mean, like, I really want to help. I want to give them the tools they need to succeed. And I say that because it's an entrepreneur program, not only for our gardening program, but we do sewing here. And a lot of the ladies that learn that skill can bring those, um, they can sell their products. You know, they can do the regalia, the um, star quilts or whatever they're sewing. But there's also art class here. We have music lessons here and we do um, basketball. You know, there's a lot of talents and everything. And like right now we have tuxedos that we're renting out for prom. So there's all kinds of things that I know that we were able to, and it's all with collaborating with different partners, you know, and making sure that we're not reinventing the wheel and stuff. And I, I try to gain partnerships in all of our community um, organizations. So I like working with other people and I like bringing in community members. And so like our, our, our center here, um, we don't have a set, um, instructor for one class, because I believe that the community themselves have talents and I want, to, want them to share their talents with the students. And so we bring in um, just an individual that has a talent in beading or it has a talent in, in canning or whatever. So just bringing in the, the basic um, individual, the community members and stuff and sharing their life experiences. I think that's really empowering to other people because of just, I don't know, it's just, I just believe that it's, it's something that I want to do and um, it's something that I do do. I have um, bring in different organizations and collaborate with different people, individual peoples. Thank you, thank you. Um, no, one question for uh, both uh, Ms. Rose and for Dr. Niels. In your experience in, uh, in this approach, which involves compassion and practice, have you encountered resistance? And uh, how did you deal with it? Because it seems to me that this is a progression from resistance to resilience, and that's achieved through compassion. And so in your experience, either in your Pine Ridge community, in the case of Ms. Rose, or with, uh, with, with the system, college system for Dr. Niels, how is it that uh, perhaps you encountered resistance and dealt with it? Uh, could we start with this, Rose? It's really hard around here. Um, our area here is small, but there's a lot of territorialism within programs. And so I just do what I need to do. You know, I just advertise what we're doing and invite everybody to come. And if they want to participate, then they can. We opened up our age groups from um, middle school to elders and just visit, you know, just visit with people and, and reassure them that, you know, we can do something here. And so there was a lot of tension, I guess, and there's a lot of resistance, but I think if we keep on doing what we're doing and stay consistent in our programming and people will see that it's what we're, what we're trying to accomplish here. Thank you. Dr. Niels. Yes, thank you for this question. Um, from resistance to resilience, I like that a lot because it, in my perspective, it's a road of hope. And uh, Rose, what you share, um, just doing what you need to do, it's the same for me. I encounter resistance all the time. Um, and I try to uh, acknowledge people who resist this approach of pausing, sensing, looking inward first, maybe questioning, um, and taking themselves not so seriously. That is not something that many academics, uh, let's say that all academics and all teachers want to do at any time of their lives. And I respect that, And uh, but I still uh, do what I need to do. And I invite people and wherever uh, the doors are open and the hearts are open, um, I share and I, I contribute and I inspire and I don't, um, put too much energy 
uh, in changing, wanting to change people who resist, because I think they have a good reason. And um, so my approach is to go where there's interest, where there's open hearts and open minds, just like in this group here. Great question. Be compassionate with resistance and people who resist would be my approach and still do what I need to do. At uh, the risk of uh, embarrassing Dr. Bala, I have to acknowledge that he's famous for uh, this kind of transformation of the students. They come in as very, very tough nuts to crack. And then uh, four years later, they are completely melted and softies. So I just want to hear from him how he achieves this transformation. Well, uh, I really don't think, um, um, I think it's a natural process and people respond to a compassionate attitude. So what happens is I have seen that more often than not, uh, when you have a compassionate attitude and you understand the other person, the other person understands that you are trying to understand him, if you get what I'm saying. So then they realize that they are in a winning cycle here. I'm not here to, uh, you know, um, downplay them or to, uh, or to uh, in any way uh, show them in a poorer light. But uh, so what happens when, they, when, when you have a compassionate attitude? then it comes across as a willingness to listen and to understand. And I find that immediately the response to that is very positive. And 99% of the cases, they're very happy uh, to, uh, to be participating in that kind of a, uh, interaction. Um, another thing we do here, uh, since you raised the topic of students, uh, uh, Dr. Siram, is, as you know, and Amma has started this Living Labs program where our students actually go into villages and they uh, work in rural settings because several of our students come from quite, uh, what shall I say, um, fortunate backgrounds because they're getting an extremely good education and all that. So Amma made it a point that the students should also go into the villages and look at the problems that the rural people in India face. And to, and to work on a solution for that. So they go to the villages, they look at, uh, they, 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 they um, what shall I say, uh, they come up with what they think is a major problem in that village and they come back and work on a cost-effective solution and they go back and deploy it and they get credit for it. So this has become a humongously successful program called Live in Labs. So we have students, you know, for example, who have gone in there and installed solar panels in a village which never had electricity from time immemorial. And now that village has electricity, we had students go and do rainwater harvesting, composting, medical help, then uh, helping the village lead chieftains to uh, connect to the government agencies. And so do so many things. But I will tell you, invariably, uh, out of, I mean, every student has come back saying that they have gained more than they have given. And this uh, program attracted international attendin, uh, attention. It still does. And we have students from you know, UC Davis, from San Diego, from Japan come and participate in this. And these students are actually in tears when they leave. So they live with the villages along with the villages in same in rustic conditions compared to what they otherwise would have been. But at the same, but they don't regret it at all. They come back, they say we are that much more well, richer for that experience. They come back with, some of them have tears in their eyes when they want to come back. So that it in, increases their empathy so much, their ability, their compassion so much. So that is a practice, best practice. I mean, you talked about Udaharan that I wanted to bring up, which, uh, uh, which what happens is when you uh, introduce people to others who are, I mean, the compassionate attitude, and then you understand the problems of others, and suddenly you understand the blessings of your own life, and what you can do to help others. And finally, I think what the students really get, one of them, they understood the joy of giving. I mean, that is such an important thing. They understood the joy of giving. So when they did that, they understood that's a joy that is far deeper than the other joys that they're used to. 
and uh, so uh, that's all i have to say actually so it's the uh, it's 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 uh, compassion gives you a lot of joy and uh, that joy is very infectious and a compassionate world will be a very very mutually happier world also uh, yeah so that's that's what i have to say <laughs> thank you so much dr bala and now with uh, the last few minutes maybe uh, just one minute each if i may request each of you to just reflect on the discussions today and uh, give one or two points that you think should be uh, taken into the policy draft in terms of compassion as a cornerstone when we think about designing community development when we think about designing local development what recommendations would you have based on your experience based on your wisdom if you could share in about a minute minute and a half and then we can take notes of that and then we can use that for our policy draft as well so uh, again i'll start with uh, ms rose then dr niels and then we can end with dr bala <laughs> Wow, that's a um, big question there. I just like what um, Dr. Bala was saying. Um, his compassion gives you joy and that it turns into be infectious. I just, I really like that. I, on as far as policy change and everything like that, you guys, you know, I, I'm sorry. There's so much, I, I, I don't know where to, I don't know how to, um, I don't know how to answer that. I'm sorry. I, I can go last. Maybe somebody can give me. Sure. <laughs> so I, I, I see Dr. Anthony, uh, Mr. Anthony here. So perhaps we can have uh, uh, some closing comments and uh, any kind of policy recommendations if, if you're willing to share. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for, for the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Siram, do you hear me? Uh, am I? Okay, good. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for the opportunity to invite us to speak at this uh, uh, forum. Uh, we want to take this subject seriously. It is uh, one of those, uh, what I call the software that should be running our policy agenda. Unfortunately, we are still stuck in the old conventional uh, policy approaches. Uh, this, of course, introduces us now to new ways of thinking or how we can uh, advocate for people-centered policies that really understand or that take care of uh, people's needs and aspirations. So I think for us, it's a new uh, way of, you know, understanding how policies should be formulated and how they should be implemented. So we thank you so much and we look forward to uh, engaging uh, again. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Niels? Well, I, I, I would encourage um, considering to add into the curriculum of people who study to work with other people, kindergarten teachers, social workers, teachers, uh, physicians, people who work with people in their training, I would encourage um, subjects like self-care, self-compassion, living in a diverse inner world, um, cultivating the skill to be um, resilient and um, connected with myself and with the rest of the world. Sorry, Dr. Niels, you're breaking up. Okay. Oh, or is it a problem on my end? I'm, I'm not able to hear you. I'm not sure. I'm just going to take I'm off the video. Hear. So to make it short, um, cultivating uh, inner compassion uh, as part of, of curricula 
uh, in education, educational settings for people who work with people, teachers, social workers, physicians. Um, and then, um, like Dr. Bala said, uh, including um, situations where they can actually experience the joy of giving and being compassionate with the outside world. If we, if we, and I don't think it's difficult to include those into the curricula, into the teaching um, curricula for, for people who want to work with other people. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Dr. Bala? Um, actually, uh, Dr. Niels uh, took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> so <laughs> absolutely, I think uh, all uh, students, social workers, um, um, physicians, um, engineers, everybody should have in their educational process or in the, even in a corporate process, a couple of courses that they have to, that they have to uh, take in understanding uh, so social commitments and connections and empathy and compassion, self-compassion, of course, and self, you know, self-compassion is so important. If you think about the increasing alarming rate of suicides uh, all across the world, um, I, especially after the COVID time, I have seen that uh, the mental health of students has really taken a toll. Uh, uh, here in nearby campuses, we had a couple of, uh, you know, very sad cases uh, here itself because families and so uh, and inability to cope with the peers and being looked down upon and this this kind of uh, tension and pressure. So we have to have uh, par, uh, par, uh, we have to have this in the curricula of schools and colleges, and also even in corporate settings. Now they have CSR in India, right? Corporate social responsibility uh, a course or so in compassion as a as a, what shall I say, as a vital ingredient in policy making. It's not just for one's own profits. One cannot profit uh, by, I cannot profit myself all the time uh, by fleecing others. It's not sustainable. At some point, I will find that uh, it will boomerang on me. So uh, if, if I cannot go to the other extreme of uh, selfless love that Amma talks about, I would at least like people to uh, understand what is enlightened selfishness in terms of when you when you know in a mutual uh, give and take relationship that when you help others you are also helped that kind of understanding should somehow be brought about uh, in in medicine also uh, there's so much uh, emphasis on uh, you know even in developed countries i have been in the us i have been in europe and i find that um, health care is not provided uh, easily enough to everybody um, and it's very strange. Uh, there are some local villages in India where the villager can get health care better because the whole setup is more compassionate. Whereas in New York, I, I found people who found it very difficult to, you know, meet their uh, doctors in time, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, insurance and so many other things. I'm not blaming any particular country here, but I think um, accessibility to health care, uh, then um, accessibility to uh, reforms, uh, th these kinds of thought processes should be there and it should start from curriculum it should start from kindergarten and having these uh, as uh, dr neil said should be included lessons on compassion should be included as uh, in uh, in the curriculum of all education and the corporate training also um, uh, and that would really make uh, the world a better place thank you dr bala and uh, miss rose I was just listening to everybody. Wow, that's a lot. I mean, policy change. That is a lot. I mean, compassion should be included in it. The things that kind of work for us, um, including in like policy change, is hands-on and visual learning. A lot of the people, you know, I think those two things need to be on it and it's been, and it's worked for us, our hands-on demonstration, and then um, actually being able to you know, come and do a project and seeing how it's done. So visual and hands-on. Thank you so much. I think we have uh, exceeded our time. So we'll uh, bring this to a close. It's been a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Uh, very thought-provoking. 
And certainly these inputs are very important in terms of uh, taking it into the policy draft. I think we've uh, had the right combination of uh, head and heart today. And, and it is said that uh, compassion without discernment would not be advisable. This discernment without compassion would be disastrous. And compassion with discernment would definitely be most desirable. And I think with that note, we will certainly pay very close attention to every point in this wonderful discussion today. It's been recorded. We will take this and feed it into the C20, which in turn will go into the G20. It uh, will get the attention of the policy designers, policy implementers. Certainly, uh, if they use compassion as a foundation, as a cornerstone, I'm sure it's going to bring some very, very significant and sweeping benefits. And uh, they, I'm sure, would be inspired by the Udaharans, the examples that also came out today and that I believe uh, we can collect more of uh, offline as well. And uh, once we feed these examples, I think the, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, with these examples, whether it's in an academic setting or in the reservations, or in, in, a, in an urban metro in a developed country. All of these certainly will be useful. They add to the diversity of voice. They add to the inclusivity. So with that, I'm sure our voice will be very credible in uh, giving these inputs for C20 and subsequently to G20. So I am very, very uh, deeply appreciative of the audience. They've stayed very patiently till the end. And it's it's been over two hours. And so thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Really appreciated. This kind of support is what thank you, motivates all of us. Uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to several more discussions on this global platform. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Wonderful day. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a way to share the recording with us? Yes, uh, we have uh, your email so we can uh, share it with you. That's lovely. Yeah, I would appreciate that. Sure, Thank sure. you very much. All the best. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Sayram, for setting this Thank up. You, Dr. Thank you for the opportunity yeah, for great, me to visit all event. these people. Mm. Thank and you. it gives me hope that they are like-minded individuals and I'm not the only crazy guy, engineer talking about compassion and there are others <laughs> who are uh, daring enough. Um, <laughs> so I'm very happy that, I mean, the very fact that we are even talking about compassion and empathy and things like that in a world that is, you know, going in a, that gives me hope. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Bala, would you would you sh uh, share your email address? Maybe we can continue. Of course. Yeah. I, am, I, I, I type it right here. Yeah, great. Bala at am.amrita.edu. I put it in the chat box. So, yeah, I'm the Dean of Engineering in one of um, Amrita's camp, many campuses. Sriram is the uh, Dean in the other campus. And so, uh, yeah, Bala, I, 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 I have put it there. Bala at am.amrita.edu. Perfect. They have the YouTube link as well, Dr. Niels. Great. Yeah, I see that. You Great. That Thanks a lot. Thank you, Shivan, for sharing that. And Dr. Niels, yeah, you can sure. please share your email IDs with me and I will. Uh, and there's a lot of background work that goes on. So I want to thank the team as well with uh, Dr. Manisha's provost's office, Vaishak, who's done the whole setup with the it's link. to South Dakota. Yes. <laughs> Sarin and Regina and Dr. Shivan and the whole team. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I also I openly invite you all when you visit India to visit our campuses and visit us and, you know, uh, talk to our students and look at this. They will benefit in infinitely from you, from you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.